Welcome. The following is a recorded program of IEEE Region 3. Please enjoy. This particular program was recorded on Thursday, May 13, 2021. It contains a pair of presentations by Kathy Land and Steve Welby. Kathy is the 2021 IEEE President and CEO of IEEE. Steve is the IEEE Executive Director and COO of IEEE. Due to a technical glitch, the recording begins with an introduction to the two speakers by IEEE Region 3 Director Jill Gostin, already in progress. That recording will begin in a moment. So it's really an honor to have her, her here talking to us tonight. Uh, President Land is a program manager for the U.S. Department of Defense Missile, De Missile Defense Agency, um, and she has more than 30 years of industry experience. She has led IEEE through, uh, you know, countless volunteer roles across the vast array of IEEE operations from standards to the professional societies, um, vice president of TAB. She's just been in, in multiple roles. She's also an IEEE fellow and an IEEE Ada Kappa new member, and she is a recipient of the IEEE Computer Society uh, Richard E. Merwin Award. And we'll also have a talk tonight by Steve Land, our executive director, who is also an IEEE fellow. He brings um, extensive experience in leadership from serving as the U.S. Assistant Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Um, in, in that role, he also served, he uh, served as the Chief Technology Officer for the U.S. Department of Defense. He also brings more than 30 years of experience, both from the government and industry side in technology and product development. He came on board as the executive director and COO at IEEE in January of 2018. And, um, you know, to me, one of the most significant things he was and is key to IEEE's um, navigation, actually, I should say successful navigation through the COVID pandemic. So it's really my honor tonight to have them both here talking to us. Thank you both. I know how incredibly busy you both are, so I really appreciate you taking time out to be here for us tonight. And um, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Kathy. Thanks. Um, I don't think you realized it, Jill, but you called Steve, Steve Land. And um, I, we work a lot together, but we're not that close yet. So it's <laughs> Steve Welby. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> We feel like we're evil twins, but we're not that close <laughs> yet. So anyway, <laughs> I'm sorry to about make that. that correction. That's okay. I, you did a great introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to share my content. So let me find my presentation and, and see. Let me know if you can see it. We so, um, okay, great. So I'm going to talk a little bit um, about some different things. I know um, sometimes you hear from presidents and you and you hear some really great things from them, but um, you often sort of hear about IEEE and you might hear some of the same things I know that I have over the years. So I wanted to, people ask me some, they want to hear, when I go out and I talk to people, they ask me questions about my roles in IEEE or how I got to where I I am as president and CEO and and so that's what I'm going to talk to you about tonight because you're my home region and I've also been talking um, in a different kind of form of this speech to some young professionals and you'll hear you'll see this uh, topic but this is a different version of this talk especially for you in region three um, <clears throat> just to give you some insight um, into who I am and um, how I sort of how I got here and maybe give you some insight into what makes me tick okay so, I don't know, maybe you'll like this talk, maybe you won't. But, um, so, as you heard, I've been around a while, um, 57, uh, which is, uh, I don't know, I started working when I was 20. So, um, that's how I got the 30 years experience. I took some time off of my kids for a little bit. But um, it has been a journey. And the one thing I do want to say about this journey is that um, I wouldn't have gotten to where I am if it hadn't been for IEEE. I have kind of a unique path 
And that's one thing that I want to stress to people, and I think we should share this with people. IEEE's field of interest is very broad. It's not just electrical engineering. Sometimes we forget that. We forget that when we're reaching out to people. We forget to tell people you don't have to have a degree to be a member of IEEE. Um, and we forget that um, we need lots of people, lots of diversity, uh, technical diversity in IEEE. Um, and I'm one of those people. I'm a software engineer. I kind of fell into computing um, in the 80s. And um, so I'm one of those weird people and now I'm president and CEO. But I wouldn't have been as successful in my career and I've had a very successful career if I hadn't been finding IEEE early in my career. And that's, I think, what we need to share with others um, as we are volunteers in IEEE and we're talking to other people I mean, in our own personal journeys. So I'm going to talk about today where I was when I met IEEE, again, the difference it made, how it influenced my personal goals, and then sort of how the IEEE mission and vision might be able to help you. All right, so you heard some of where, you know, my job today, but when I started out, I started out um, in, in the 80s at a place called Pacific Missile Test Center. Um, in Point Magoo, California, in the Standard Missile Laboratory. This was the SM2, um, and it was really sort of the dawn of electronic warfare. <clears throat> if you can see that picture of that lab, that's kind of really what it looked like. Um, and um, my husband was in the AMRAM missile lab. Um, we were on the beach at Pacific Missile Test Center, and I was 20, he was 23. And we both have I've had a TS clearance since I was 20, and it was funny because they really drilled into us, you know, not you don't have the need to know, don't talk about work. So we've never really talked about work unless it was something really strange. But he worked in the AMRAM HL lab and I worked in the standard um, HL lab. And to tell to say it was an HL lab, hardware in the leaf lab was is pretty strange if you think about how that technology has progressed today, because um, the the test environment is is really dramatically different today than it was then. Um, and then I worked at 46 Test Wing at Edwin Air Force Base, and this was all the flight mission planning software. I worked there almost 12 years and then um, was a program manager for Northrop Grumman. Um, and I was also um, a tech director um, and um, uh, uh, manager there for many years. But where I found IEEE, which I'll talk about, was when I was working at uh, 46 Test Wing. And it was a good thing I found them. Um, and then I worked for MITRE for a couple of years, three years, and then I insourced from MITRE to Missile Defense, and I've been there ever since. All right, so when did I meet IEEE? So I was working at 46 Test Wing, and this was, um, we had one product at the time. I've always had been in product development, and it's always been DOD-centric product development. I was a contractor. Now I'm a program manager in charge of major acquisitions. Um, I've moved into foreign military sales. We still do product development and acquisition oversight, and, but foreign military sales. Um, so, but I used to be a programmer. Then I was a leader of, of product of pro, program teams, and then I was a um, you know a development lead, and yada yada yada. But when I when I met IEEE, I walked into 46 Test Wing, and it was chaos. Uh, we were developing this software called. FPM, flight performance modules, and this was software. It was the first uh, piece of software that exploded into a whole suite of software that helped all the pilots. Um, uh, it was combat stores loading. Um, it was all of this stuff for like um, the jets, you know, a whole range of all the jets, but all how the pilots, um, when they flew their planes, all the calculations, everything they needed. From the from the munitions to the flight calculations, everything. So it was pretty critical software, and um, there were problems from from uh, requirements management. We had to do uh, take requirements from multiple sources, configuration management issues, design issues, just you name the issues. But software engineering as a science was not a science. I mean, it was not an engineer engineering discipline except for IEEE, and IEEE had a set of software engineering standards, um, and I found that they had these guides, 
and I used the guides to train my teams, the teams I was working with, um, to sort of get some uh, discipline in the chaos. Um, and so um, I found out um, in all their brilliance that Standards Association and the Computer Society, they were going to stop using these guides. Um, so I was not happy. And so I found a person that I worked with who was an IEEE member and he was a fellow. And at the time I viewed IEEE because remember I was a programmer and I did not have a, a engineering degree and I didn't have a computer science degree at the time. Um, I viewed IEEE as this ivory tower, a bunch of uh, electrical engineers and I didn't know really why they had these computer science uh, uh, software engineering standards, but I thought they were great and the guides were great. But I approached this guy and he said, well, if you don't like what they're doing, you can write a um, paper and you can submit it to this International Software and Systems Engineering Conference and, and tell them what you think. So I did, and I didn't think it would get accepted. And it got accepted. And so I went to the conference and they not only listened to what I had to say, they invited me to participate. And I conducted a, a, a survey and one of the first internet surveys for Tripoli of the standards users. And then they asked me to participate in the conference and then um, in the working group and then yada, yada, yada. So I, I went up to standards. Um, I was um, uh, eventually became Vice President of Computer Society Standards and other offices in the Computer Society and then was President of the Computer Society. But my moral here is that um, I found IEEE not only to be extremely helpful as an industry practitioner, um, but the people in IEEE who, when I turned to them and said, look, I'm in industry, these are very helpful, um, I want to provide some input and some feedback, didn't turn me away. They welcomed me and valued what I had to say, even when I was, I think at the time I was like 28 years old. So it was a very valuable and it, it had a great impact on me that I could come in and, and in a very respectful way, provide some feedback and I was listened to. Um, so then uh, you, as Jill referred, uh, mentioned, um, I was um, VP of technical activities. I've been on the board a number of times. I was on the USA board. Um, but the one thing I want to say is that I have had many, many, many uh, committee roles. Um, I didn't ever take a volunteer job until I really felt like I understood the position I was walking into. Um, so. Um, there are lots of volunteer jobs within IEEE, lots of opportunities to serve, and that's the one thing that we should let people know if they're interested. Um, there are many things, many activities, many roles to be had within this IEEE um, structure that we all uh, know and love. Um, so this is sort of the direct impact on my early career. Um, I was the conference presenter and at the time I was a programming team lead. And then when I was publicity chair, I led larger teams. So I was the software standards working group chair and then I was leading multiple teams, secretary of standards committee, a section manager, chair of the software engineering standards committee. I was a section manager, vice president of conferences um, uh, for standards that I was writing books about um, standards and software process improvement. And then I was a uh, Vice President of uh, Conferences and Second Vice President of Computer Society. That's when I was Northrop Grumman Fellow and a Technical Director for Huntsville uh, Operations. And the point is, is that I provided my company, I let my company know what I was doing at IEEE. They saw my leadership development in IEEE and I was rewarded with leadership growth in my company. So it was important. I think it's important to let young professionals or people know that if you're doing, if you're having leadership growth in IEEE, to let your companies know. So, um, if you've heard me talk before, I apologize for the repeat of this chart, but I believe it's extremely important that um, if you're in uh, uh, a volunteer leadership position at IEEE or involved in the section or, uh, or in your region, that we we let people know that there are lots of opportunities. Um, to, for participation in IEEE. 
um, people join IEEE, like I joined. I was a, I was a volunteer for three years before I joined IEEE. I worked in, in the conference. I worked at a standards. Uh, I was a participant in a standards working group. You don't have to be a member of the standards association or IEEE, and unless you want to ballot on the standard you're working on, um, and that's how they hooked me. I wanted to ballot on that standard that I'd worked on so hard. But um, but I've worked in uh, technical activities, standards, um, educational activities, conferences. So you know if there's one area. People may come in for one reason and then move all across the organization, but we need to let them know that these other opportunities exist. Um, these are uh, just some of the standards. Uh, people often don't realize the depth and breadth of standards that IEEE has to offer and all of the different opportunities. These are a handful. Um, there are over 1100 active um, uh, new and revised standards and 600 um, projects. I think. There may be more than that, but um, the last number I saw was 600. But these are opportunities to, for participation. Technical activities. Um, these are the societies. There are also councils. And I list all the societies because, again, um, this represents the fields of interest, right? So people don't often realize we have a broadcast technology society, right? Um, they know, you know, or Oceanic Engineering Society. So it's important to let people know that we have these. These are included in IEEE's portfolio. Um, technical communities. These are um, um, uh, councils. We also have councils represent um, uh, cross uh, uh, multiple societies uh, that collaborate, like Sensors Council. But we also have technical communities. Um, technical communities are emer emerging technologies, and some, these are listed on the on the screen. And these don't cost any money. These are, are you could, are included basically in your IEEE membership. All you have to do is is sign up and participate. And these are the councils. And again, the councils are also included in your membership. You just have to sign up and participate. Um, educational activities. We've done a tremendous amount of work in the area of uh, educational activities. Um, we now cover uh, what I like to say is the entire uh, lifespan of the uh, tech of, uh, um, of a technologist from kindergarten through uh, post retirement. So we have Tri Engineering Together, which is K through 12, and it includes uh, volunteers, teachers, parents, and, and kids. And we launched that in January this year. And we have um, Epics, which is a volunteering for students. Um, it's uh, like uh, uh, humanitarian activities. And then we have the learning network, which is for professional development. And then people are interested in humanitarian activities. I, I've heard people say, why does IEEE have humanitarian activities? Well, all of us in Region 3 understand why, because we have MOVE. And MOVE, we know the, the benefits of having uh, something like MOVE, not only to the IEEE brand, but to the benefit that it brings uh, the people in our region when the move truck goes out on a disaster relief mission. So there are lots of other opportunities to get engaged. I know that all of you are very engaged in Region 3 um, activities, but there are other things to do. And it's important if you know somebody that's not engaged, uh, if you have somebody that you work with that's an IEEE member and they're not as engaged as you are, Think of some of these things and try to get them as, as more engaged. There are other opportunities and we have a volunteer portal now. It's volunteer.ieee.org and you might point them to that if, and see if there's something there that might interest them. So um, uh, how did IEEE influence my careers and goals? Um, I got promoted faster. I made better money. These are some things you tell other people. I just tell them straight up. Um, I, I uh, benefited, uh, I grew better, faster technically from the software engineering, the computer science and the standards. It looks like we temporarily lost Kathy. Kathy, if you can hear us, maybe you can reconnect. 
Jill, Kathy's off is uh, a, a little bit rural in Alabama, and so sometimes uh, she does have a momentary disconnection. I, I just uh, give her a minute to see if she can reconnect. Okay. I sent her a text. I wondered if maybe losing her slides meant that she had tried logging off and would call back in. But she hasn't responded to the text either. And nor mine. Okay. Um, Charles, do you have her slides do, to know how many slides she had left, how far she was into her presentation? Unfortunately, she did not send them. I'm okay. double checking my inbox, but. Uh, I think I think that's right. I think she had said she would just push them herself. So I, I might suggest we just go ahead with Steve and then if Kathy joins, we can join back up, you know, pick up where she left off. Are you okay with that, Steve? Sure, happy to. Okay, great. Um, Charles, can you go ahead and share Steve's slides? Yes, just a moment. Um, I'm in the process. Well, uh, super, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to to speak to everyone tonight. Um, uh, uh, I've got a presentation here that's uh, uh, with a grandiose title of uh, State of IEEE. Um, I'm, I'm going to hopefully uh, just uh, give you a couple of quick updates on things that are happening around IEEE. Um, and I'll be happy to take any questions folks have when we get to the Q&A session. Um, if I could get the next chart. I I do uh, really appreciate the opportunity to to kind of get together with everyone and uh, uh, share a little bit about what's happening. I always try to start uh, these kind of talks by coming back to um, our core story, what we're what we're about, and uh, and what our mission is. And I think um, uh, I like this chart because it's uh, uh, the bumper sticker uh, where forward thinking technology professionals collaborate. Because so much of what we do at IEEE is really about collaboration, whether it's um, uh, in meetings, whether it's in uh, local membership activities, whether it's collaborating through the mechanisms of our uh, publications or standards, it's about sharing. 
Um, it's about sharing connection with other professionals in our local areas. It's about being part of a global community in our technical fields. It's about being part of uh, the technologies that are shaping the world around us. And um, uh, when I look at the technology that shaped the last uh, 50 years, um, uh, so many of them, almost all of them, uh, are core competencies of IEEE. Um, and uh, uh, we have a series of missions to, to help uh, uh, support uh, uh, technical innovation, to create international standards, as Kathy talked about, um, the work we do on building technical communities and um, uh, uh, in our uh, membership activities, our, in uh, our technical activities, as, as Kathy showed the org chart, and um, the work that we do in uh, supporting research, um, uh, from uh, support for students all the way through uh, uh, publications. Um, when I uh, uh, joined IEEE as the executive director, one thing that really struck me was how simple and clear our mission is. I've seen lots of organizations with grandiose mission statements, but IEEE's is very clear and to the point, um, we're here to um, uh, advance technology for the benefit of humanity. And uh, I think that's, uh, you know, as simple as you can make it. Um, it's really about uh, our role as technologists and it's our role of technologists in context. And I think that's a kind of a great uh, mission statement. Next, next chart. If you look at where we are today, um, IEEE is, uh, you can look at IEEE through a number of lenses. Um, uh, one lens is to look at our uh, uh, societies and councils. We have 39 uh, technology societies that represent all the key and important areas in uh, electrical engineering, computer science, and affiliated fields. Um, and seven cross cutting uh, technical councils that uh, span intersections between those uh, traditional technology interests. Uh, we have uh, today in our Explorer uh, database um, where we capture all the publication output of IEEE uh, journals, magazines, and conferences proceedings. Um, we now have over 5 million documents, um, which represent uh, kind of the history of our fields, the core uh, capabilities on which uh, our, our fields are built. And it's actively used uh, just last month. We had over 15 million uh, downloads of documents from that uh, repository. Uh, uh, Kathy talked about standards. We have over 1,200 active standards, um, 900 standards projects developing new standards. Um, we publish uh, today over 200 uh, journals, uh, transactions, and magazines. It's a very significant output for one of the largest scientific and technical publishers in the world, certainly the largest in, um, in our fields. Um, uh, many of our, our journals, of course, are the highest rated journals in their fields. And um, we continue to sponsor conferences. Last year, we conducted over 1,600 uh, conferences despite uh, the impact of COVID. Um, a year before, we had over 1,900 conferences, and I expect in the future we'll come back to that number. Um, and if we had not been impacted by the pandemic, we would have been in 96 different countries last year with technical conferences. And then uh, something that we often uh, uh, don't see as, as part of our impact is the work that we do on uh, global public policy whether it be uh, IEEE USA representing folks in, uh, in Washington, and, and uh, you know, we're very active today in, in helping to shape uh, legislation around technology investment and future technology policy, or the work that we do in Brussels, for example, with the EU uh, out of our Vienna office. It provides our members with a voice um, to be able to inform uh, public policy around the world uh, with the technical details. And then, of course, uh, uh, as a member of IEEE, we, we agreed to uphold the IEEE Code of Ethics, and uh, our professional ethics are key um, to the way we represent ourselves to the broader world. Next chart. Um, uh, I'm going to just quickly show some membership numbers, and I, you can see the impacts of COVID here. Um, in uh, red, you can see the membership numbers. Uh, uh, this is total IEEE membership. The membership numbers in, in red uh, for 2019. Uh, in blue for the COVID year of 2020, and you can see in black where we are um, uh, today uh, uh, in uh, 2021. And I'm pleased that um, uh, we are now at a point where uh, uh, total IEEE membership is only is now actually up uh, a tenth of a percent uh, over where it was um, a year ago during COVID, and we're starting to to see some recovery back towards the numbers we had uh, pre-COVID. Um, next chart. Um, I uh, uh, note that higher grade membership has been the most impacted. Um, uh, our higher grade membership globally is down about 2.7% year over year. 
But you can see if you look out on the chart and the gap between the red and blue lines, we had a much deeper hole um, uh, in August and September last year, for example, at the height of the pandemic here in the, uh, in the United States. And then uh, next chart, uh, two things that I think are, are very positive. Um, we've seen a dramatic increase in student membership, um, largely in uh, Region 10, where campus is opened. Student membership is directly tied uh, in an important way to being present on campus and uh, engage with other uh, other students. But uh, today, uh, uh, student membership is up almost 8.6 percent over where it was this time last year, and it's almost fully recovered to where it was in 2019. Uh, I worry a little bit about the impact of the, the recent wave in India, for example, on membership uh, there, but we were working to, uh, with a real focus on student membership over the last uh, 12 months. And then finally, uh, society membership on the next chart, uh, uh, you can see the, the actually society membership numbers have fully recovered from the pre-COVID, uh, from the COVID impacts, the gap that opened up this year and today. Um, we're up 2.8% over last year's numbers, and in fact, uh, well ahead of where we were in 2019 pre-COVID. So, I'm uh, I'm optimistic that as economies open, as uh, campuses return, as people return to work, as we're able to meet in person again, uh, we're going to see uh, folks coming back to IEEE. The interest in IEEE has only grown, I think, over the, the last year, and we've got to cement that by um, uh, focusing on membership. Um, I'll note that uh, we've had a real interesting experience uh, uh, through COVID where uh, meetings, local meetings that might have had uh, 20 or 30 people show up um, as we virtualized them and now started to publicize them worldwide. We've sometimes seen 1,000, 2,000 members show up at a very hot topic that might have been sponsored by a, a local, local section. I'll note that, for example, uh, a chapter in Maine uh, uh, ran a, a three week series of uh, seminars on artificial intelligence, uh, expecting about 100 attendees uh, locally, uh, virtualized it. Uh, we used our IEEE tools to publicize it, um, and they had uh, over 5,000 uh, participants in each from as far away as Malaysia. And um, I think that's uh, one way that we've learned from uh, COVID is to leverage the tools that IEEE is so deeply involved in um, to help uh, re increase our reach and keep increase our connection to each other, regardless of where we are. Uh, next chart. Uh, I just want to give a quick operational status on IEEE. I'm the chief operating officer. I oversee the IEEE staff, and I, I just want to let you know uh, how the staff is doing. Um, uh, right now, uh, our offices in uh, New Jersey and in New York, where I am uh, here tonight, uh, have been open since August of last year um, with reduced occupancy. Um, much of our staff is still working from home, uh, but as folks have gotten vaccinated and as uh, risk levels have dropped. We're bringing people back to the office, and I expect they'll see a very significant return to the office here in the next few months. Um, we've been uh, remained closed in uh, Washington D.C. and in California on the advice of local authorities, but I uh, I expect to announce in the next week or two the reopening of the Washington and uh, California offices uh, probably around the middle of June. We're putting the last uh, dotting the last I's and crossing T's on paperwork to allow us to reopen both offices. We expect uh, the uh, restrictions on business operations to be lifted in both both areas here shortly, and we're ready to reopen those offices immediately. Um, our office in uh, Tokyo has been op open uh, since October. Uh, our office in Beijing has been open since February. We, it was the first office to close for six weeks, and we reopened it after a six week period. And um, activities in China have been largely uh, stable since uh, since February. Our Singapore office, uh, we just uh, reduced its occupancy last year due to the new outbreak in, in Singapore. Our office in Vienna is uh, uh, still remains closed, waiting for advice from local authorities to reopen. Um, and uh, of course, the news in India is uh, is a bit grim. Um, uh, you know, we uh, we had closed the office in India earlier, um, reopened uh, the office, and then closed it uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, right before the uh, crest of the current wave hit. Um, right now, uh, we have a number of staff members in India, for example, who are currently um, uh, quite ill with COVID. Our, uh, our concern, they're in our, our thoughts and prayers, our concerns go out to them, but a real impact on volunteers and members across India, um, and we're carefully monitoring our situations there. Um, uh, we are uh, now in the United States, of course, um, uh, seeing a lifting. I was very pleased to see um, even uh, CDC advice tonight that uh, even reduces restrictions even further. 
Um, and we're now planning to have our first uh, major in person conference here with the United States in a hybrid format with uh, a, a group of folks in attendance and a group of folks who will be attending virtually. Um, but that will be in Atlanta in uh, in June, um, the International Microwave um, uh, Symposium. And I'm looking to join uh, my fellow uh, IEEE members um, uh, at that meeting. Uh, it's going to be in interesting for us. We're going to learn from that event, and hopefully that'll help us uh, begin to uh, learn lessons to restore our in-person uh, large-scale meeting activities. Next chart. Just a quick bit of uh, kind of news you can use. Um, uh, 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 a year, just a little bit over a year ago, the IEEE uh, board directors approved an investment in upgrading uh, uh, our tools, our business tools that operate behind the scene across IEEE. Um, uh, and we've uh, spent a year working on a major, uh, I think the biggest software rollout, uh, back office software rollout in IEEE's history. Um, and uh, it all came online on May 1st. And uh, if you don't know this, uh, that's a good thing because that means that there, uh, we didn't have any major disruption and we've been able to roll those tools out. Um, it integrates uh, for treasurers uh, banking and allows a lot more electronic transactions. It allows us to move tools to the cloud. Um, it gets us out of a, a 19 kind of 50s mentality of being able to do monthly accounting reports for people to be able to give people uh, on online cloud access to actively financials at any time. And so um, uh, this should be largely transparent to to most of our volunteers. If you're a treasurer uh, or you're a, co a conference organizer, you're probably quite well aware of this and we've been working on a, a schedule for rollout that'll uh, happen over the rest of the year. Next chart. This has been a year where we've done an a, a enormous amount of work under um, uh, uh, first uh, uh, President uh, Fukuda's leadership and now uh, Kathy Land's major emphasis on education across IEEE. I just wanted to uh, note a number of upcoming activities uh, sponsored by uh, uh, IEEE's uh, Educational Activities uh, Board. Um, I think that this is an area where we're seeing enormous cooperation and collaboration across IEEE. And you can see from the logos here just some of the upcoming activities, um, uh, work on business applications of machine learning, uh, tech talks on wireless LAN standards, um, uh, conversations about AI and ethics, um, being brought to the largest possible audience through our educational activities. And so a major focus on providing uh, technically relevant information uh, uh, free to members through these kind of webinar series. Um, uh, President Land also spoke about our, our support for um, uh, young people. And I'll, I'll, um, I'll note that we've been very active in, in education, not just on, uh, uh, on the STEM portal, which I'll talk about in a second, but also in some of the activities that Kathy showed. Uh, our Try Engineering Together activity, for example, allows uh, classrooms uh, in uh, uh, underprivileged uh, schools to, um, uh, for companies to be able to sponsor those classrooms and provide remote mentors to uh, students who might never have met an engineer before. Um, we've built a, a pretty sophisticated program for summer institutes, which unfortunately we had to cancel this year due to COVID, uh, but we've got uh, significant sponsorship from outside to provide uh, free scholarships for summer engineering experiences for young people. And I'm looking forward to next year um, in a lower risk environment, being able to bring a lot of that back. Next chart. I'm going to just move through some of this uh, uh, quickly. I assume that the charts can be distributed, but uh, uh, we just had uh, 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 just a week or two ago, um, a uh, uh, four day session uh, on IEEE publications. And for those of you who are interested in our publishing activities, our panel of editors uh, meeting is the kind of uh, highlight of the year where we look at issues of publication ethics, we look at the evolution of the publishing environment. We ask, how does IEEE support um, advancing uh, research and open science through our publication practices? And I was very pleased by the enormous participation, the great energy that was shown at this meeting. Next chart. Just the last uh, few days, it just ended, uh, just a few hours. Uh, uh, next chart, please. Um, thank you. Uh, just uh, the last few hours, uh, we just uh, completed uh, this year's um, uh, Vision, Innovation, and Challenges Summit, which is an event where we bring in uh, guest speakers, but maybe more importantly, we recognize all the winners of IEEE's highest awards. And uh, if you're interested in, in hearing, um, uh, inspira uh, seeing some, some real inspirational folks uh, who've done amazing work and represent kind of the best of our fields, I encourage you to take a look at this. Um, 
Uh, as of uh, just an hour ago, all of the, uh, the three day sessions are now up for viewing on IEEE TV and you can click on the links on this chart uh, when it's distributed. It'll take you right there. Next chart. I did want to very quickly mention um, so our future directions activity. Um, if you're not aware, future directions are where IEEE incubates its future, our engagement with emerging technical fields. And on this chart, you can see just some of the logos of some of the things that have emerged from uh, future directions. Um, our work uh, on uh, 5G and beyond, for example, in IEEE future networks, the growth of our engagement in quantum science under the IEEE quantum initiative, um, the, the work going on in IEEE smart grid, rethinking uh, power transmission and distribution, um, the uh, large efforts on uh, uh, sustainable ICT and uh, uh, green electronics are the work that's gone on into big data. Um, and that work continues. I think we have a very active portfolio of future directions activities, and I encourage uh, all of you to, to look into this and engage with these programs. Again, a link to the full portfolio on the chart. Next chart. Um, I just wanted to highlight just a couple of things that are, are happening in this space to include uh, the, the new work going on on uh, our uh, network generational roadmap, uh, looking at uh, our uh, the the not just 5G and the many variants of 5G that are emerging around the world, but looking beyond 5G into where future communication technology will take commercial networks, um, trying to build a structure around that to help um, both industry and academic uh, users um, contribute to that evolution. Um, and then work looking at uh, uh, healthcare, including some very cool things looking at applying blockchain technology to healthcare, uh, work going on on uh, what we're now calling digital reality, which is our uh, work that combines uh, virtual reality and artificial and augmented reality, um, looking at new ways for human computer interaction, um, and uh, major efforts looking at uh, quantum education. How do we uh, support future workforce needs uh, for quantum technologies? And again, uh, live links to those in the brief. Next chart. Uh, just to uh, quickly mention some other things that are coming up. Um, if you haven't participated before in the uh, IEEE USA, uh, EVO conferences, the Evolution of You conferences. These are very interesting meetings that look at career development in a technical context. Um, uh, we provide uh, talks from industry leaders. Um, we provide uh, tools, um, not just technical tools, but also career tools and management tools to help people rethink about their careers and the way they engage in the professional environment. And we have two upcoming events, one in June, um, EVO on campus, which is focused on uh, uh, students, student members, recent grads, uh, early career professionals, um, and in September, uh, EVO Pro, which is focused on uh, uh, mid-career professionals to provide a, 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 a focus for the different tools that we're providing. These are all now virtual events. And I, uh, they sh they're available uh, for free to all IEEE members. Next chart. Kathy mentioned uh, the volunteer STEM portal. I think this is a great initiative where we're taking all the STEM activities across IEEE and and documenting them in one place. Um, there are great things happening at the local level across IEEE. There's great things happening at the society level of IEEE, at the OU level, at the at the board level. But quite frankly, it's hard for people to find them. And we're trying to find a way to share best practices and allow people to find ways to connect and contribute, whether it's, it's supporting activities at a local school or helping to uh, build uh, uh, projects and curriculum that can be, that can be scaled globally. Um, it'll all be reflected here in the volunteer STEM portal. And then finally, uh, 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 President Land also mentioned next chart, the uh, humanitarian activities. And I just wanted to highlight one of those um, on the next chart. Thank you, um, which has been the focus on uh, on uh, uh, COVID relief uh, this year. Um, uh, the uh, IEEE Humanitarian Activities Committee, our special interest group in humanitarian technology, has taken much of the effort that they would normally uh, put out in the course of a year and has focused it on local projects focused on COVID relief around the world. And you can see some of them listed here um, in Uganda, in Canada, in India, and in Ecuador, um, where local volunteers are helping some of those most in need um, deal with the impact of the pandemic. Next chart. So I'll wrap up just to say that. Um, I think that we, uh, uh, you know, last year was uh, was just uh, an unbelievable year. Um, I was at the uh, Region 9 meeting in Peru um, when uh, they announced closure of the border and uh, told us if we, we weren't out of the country in 24 hours, we'd be put into military quarantine. 
I returned back to the United States with, as we evacuated all of the international electrical members from that meeting. Um, and uh, three days later, I closed all of our US offices. Um, uh, we shifted to an entire virtual mode, and I think we were actually very successful, both from a financial perspective, from an outreach perspective, from a member engagement perspective. From um, last year, despite the pandemic, we had more publication output than we've ever had. Um, we managed to engage students in new ways. Um, uh, I think this was a year when I was very proud of volunteers across IEEE who helped us innovate and remain agile in the face of crisis. Um, we've been operating with a distributed staff for the last year. We've been operating with distributed volunteers for the last year. We're all sick of Zoom and uh, WebEx, but uh, there's a light at the end of the tunnel now. Um, I've been amazed that we've been able to leverage the technologies that IEEE has been involved in inventing uh, to support us during this time. And I think I also include uh, the work of uh, folks in power utilities around the country who kept the lights on uh, through this crisis. I think it's an untold story about the enormous efforts that went in uh, in power generation and distribution to keep things up and running, uh, to keep the crews safe and, and operating to keep uh, the lights on. Um, I'm hoping in 21 we return to a new normal, um, but I do recognize that recovery is going to be complex around the world. Um, and while I think there's a lot of excitement here in the United States, I also recognize the challenge for our colleagues in India uh, and other parts of Asia, um, the risk in Africa and the slower recovery in Europe. And I think we're going to have to continue to remain agile and adaptive, uh, even as uh, we begin to open up here in the United States. But um, across Region 3, I'm hoping that as things return to a bit, a bit safer environment, as we're able to again uh, return to meet in person, I hope we'll all feel more joy. And I'm looking forward to kind of leveraging that joy and excitement um, as we uh, uh, maybe reinvigorate uh, IEEE in 2021. Uh, last comment I'll make is I went back into the archives, uh, IEEE, and I, I looked at the uh, at the uh, uh, global flu uh, pandemic that occurred um, uh, at the end of World War One, and IEEE went into lockdown uh, during that year. We canceled our major events, the big annual meeting. The uh, IEEE had a, a national ball at that time, which was held at the Waldorf Astoria in in, in New York. Um, uh, and we canceled it for the first time that year. Um, uh, and uh, the next year was the, the biggest year in growth uh, in IEEE's history to that point. And I'm hoping that we, history will repeat itself, that folks will see the, op that the, the value of IEEE um, and uh, coming out of the, the challenging year, uh, we'll be able to continue to serve our members and serve our mission. So again, uh, thank you all for, for the opportunity to speak tonight. I see that we've somehow managed to get the satellites aligned and the internet working again. I appreciate that I see Kathy's back with us and I'll uh, cede, the, cede the floor back to uh, President Land. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Um, Kathy, go ahead and pull your slides up and I'll just invite everybody if you no, want to go ahead and- not. I have no idea what happened. I'll let people ask Steve questions since he just finished. I thought, all my router, everything crashed. I've never had that happen before. It was a coincidence. I, I have no idea. We had to re. We were. I was running around the house like a crazy woman, re rebooting routers and asking my <laughs> husband if he'd paid the bill. <laughs> it was crazy. So <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think you were on your, so, your your summary chart. Was there any other key points you wanted to make about uh, about how I triply supported your journey? No, I triply is amazing. Raw raw. That's basically <laughs> it. Then uh, I'm not bringing my charts up again because I don't want to cause a problem. So anyway, there we go. Okay, so why don't we just, out. Why don't yeah, we just have we can every, just open up the forum? Yeah, yeah. At, to any questions, questions for either one, and I think Charles, um, I can't remember now. Charles, did you want them to submit through Q and A or through chat? Uh, either one. I uh, do prefer is uh, through the Q and A, but if it shows up on chat. Uh, we will also address that. Okay. <laughs> My poor husband. <laughs> the one question I saw, uh, Kathy, when you were speaking is how in the world do you get all this done? <laughs> how do you find time for all the things that you've been doing uh, between the, well, your career and, <laughs> and IEEE? So I do have a full time job and I just and I had a new program at the end of last year. So it's like I'm running a startup. Um, but uh, 
um, I'm not on Facebook. So that's one that's one thing. I'm not I'm not on Facebook. And I, and I do also read a lot. Um, so I have time and we have horses. So I have lots of, you know, I do, I do have free time. Um, but I don't sleep a lot. So, so the Jill's nodding. Jill, so if you ever go, Jill and I, are she friends. doesn't sleep. <laughs> So she knows that we've been on vacation together and um, I'm the curse of anybody that vacations with me because I'm usually up and I try to be really quiet, but I'm usually up at like 5 a.m. Uh, making breakfast for everybody, but um, which is good, but I'm, I'm not as quiet as I think I am. I didn't know sleep was an option. <laughs> uh uh, one question I've seen on here is, uh, does Actively have any plans to help mentor young engineers in the face of increasing teleworking? You know, it, it's harder for us to get that hands-on face-to-face um, with, uh, particularly with young engineers. And are there any programs or thoughts in that? Uh, Kathy, if I could just jump in, uh, you know, I think one one thing, and I, I, uh, one thing I think that, that we've been paying a lot of attention to uh, over the last uh, three years, and we've had uh, uh, committees across actually working on, is trying to think about the future of work. Um, uh, even before the pandemic and the emergence of kind of this uh, telecommuting environment, we've seen fundamental changes in the nature of work. Um, more and more of, uh, of recent graduates find themselves, in, and for that matter, folks over their full careers, find themselves in roles that are more transient, um, uh, where uh, you're not with one company for 30 years with a gold watch at the end, where uh, the work that you're doing um, is going to is going to evolve over time, where where you're going to be doing perhaps uh, uh, self-directed work, where you'll be doing gig work, where you'll be doing consulting and other things, and um, uh, we need to be able to support that. Our 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 traditional models have uh, kind of assumed more more uh, homogeneous careers, and careers in the future are going to be very different, and so. Uh, we've been asking what will be the needs of, uh, of folks in these kind of environments. And we see a strong need for folks to find a professional home. Um, you're not finding that kind of support from your company. You might be telecommuting. You never see your peers um, um, uh, face to face. Uh, where do you get the, uh, the education? Where do you get the water cooler background? Where do you get the technical refresh for your skills? Um, where do you get advice? Um, on uh, technical matters or professional matters or career matters. And IEEE may uh, uh, need to look to, to expanding its role to filling those gaps for our technical uh, members in the future. And so I think that's going to be an important part. And I think telecommuting, you know, that telepresence piece is only a part of the evolution of, of work. That's been a uh, focus in IEEE USA. It's, um, we have committees and technical activities that are looking at it from a technical perspective. Uh, we actually had the whole board of directors off on a retreat to talk about the changing nature of work. Um, we've been uh, we've been uh, doing research and surveys of members around the world to try and understand how it's impacting our membership in different areas. And I think that um, uh, it's going to be a major factor as our programs evolve that we're going to need to address our our members where they live. So, um, if I could follow up. So, um, last year, so there's, a, and, and I'll talk about, uh, the, Steve's talked about thinking about the future of work. It is more transient reaching out to young people, young professionals have been a focus. Um, of I in, in, in growing increasingly in the last 10 years. Okay. Um, ILN, IEEE learning network launched last year. And there are many, many courses that um, are offered really focusing um, really in a mentoring aspect. So, um, a lot, we see lots of young professionals taking those. Um, it doesn't substitute for a mentor, but they're there. Um, Collaboratech communities are springing up um, that are really uh, focused on mentoring. You can, you can find a mentor on Collaboratech. Um, there, there's a mentoring uh, uh, tool available on Collaboratech. 
Um, and then um, there are tons of webinars, particularly offered by uh, sections and chapters um, for soft skills, mentoring types of programs. Um, you should, if, if anybody in Region 3 is interested in participating or offering, if you have um, uh, those type, if you're interested in providing webinars and those types of uh, um, areas, soft skills in, part in particular, I do some of those. Um, they're really in high demand. Um, I, I did one and there were over 800 attendees. Um, resume building, soft uh, communication skills, those types of things are, are really, um, uh, they're just very thirsty. Uh, and those are a type of mentoring. Okay. So you uh, can you can answer that. Yes. Uh, next question uh, has to goes back to the concept of virtual meetings and how we've had many successes in that, and ask about how we can leverage virtual successes uh, when things do return to quote unquote normal and more in person meetings, and should we be putting a. Um, uh, I don't know if he didn't say emphasis, but sounds like we should be headed to more hybrid meetings um, and not getting away from just, you know, the transition from virtual to face to face purely. Any comments on that? I'll um, let you I, address it, Steve, because so I, 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 I do think that it, I, I agree. I, I, I do think that in the future, um, we're going to see many, many more hybrid and virtual events. Um, They've proven quite effective, and we're not going to lose that lesson learned uh, uh, from uh, the last year. Hybrid events are enormously tricky, especially on uh, revenue generating events. Uh, 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 they're they're not free. Um, uh, virtual events are not free, and it's often difficult to to charge for them. And so, cost recovery has been a been a challenge on on virtual events. And we've been experimenting with different models about. Uh, how to differentiate from the in person piece, which we might have might charge a premium for our um, uh, on virtual events. But I think we're going to see a lot more. There are things that don't work uh, very well in uh, in the virtual space. Um, student competitions have been very difficult, for example. I mean, they've been interesting, but they're not quite the same. Um, uh, uh, trade some of the some of our uh, size and councils hold uh, more trade oriented activities where there's a lot of value in engagement with exhibitors, for example. And it's very, very difficult to do uh, virtually. And so I think that in the future, you're going to see a, 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 a mix. And we've been uh, uh, both investing in tools and experimenting uh, with that mix to help inform uh, folks who want to put on meetings uh, with the, you know, what kind of options there are, ways to meet safely, ways to integrate the virtual into the, into the live, um, how to make it feel that the folks who are on virtual are not seeing, uh, you know, only part of the event or that uh, folks live um, uh, aren't getting the benefit of being there in person because of the virtual. We've been working uh, on that, and I think that um, uh, the laboratory of IEEE is a great place to experiment. We're seeing lots of very creative solutions from volunteers on new meeting types, and we're carefully cataloging those and sharing those experiences so we can do better at it. And okay, over the other... past year, there's some. Um... There's, I just want to say there's Sorry. lots of materials that are available up on MCE. If you're planning a conference, folks don't know, but there, there's lots of materials available for planning virtual events, hybrid events. Um, so go and look. If, if you're planning, um, don't try to go it alone. There's lots of material that's been uh, provided to include cost projections and that type of thing. The, the other thing that virtual events allow us to do um, is to leverage the recordings um, uh, if if they're permitted in new ways, and so uh, we're we're thinking about video as now uh, a new major product uh, uh, that that will be expected in the future. Um, when we have a technical conference, for example, but many of the sessions will be recorded, videos distributed, um, and they, and uh, when we have uh, webinars or distinguished lecture events, we record those. And they can become available, for example, to be the core of a local local uh, chapter meeting, right? Where um, we might all get together to watch a distinguished lecturer who might not be able to visit us in person, watch a video on that topic, and then have uh, a couple of experts in that area uh, locally 
um, augment or discuss some of the topics raised in that lecture. And I, I think that there's new ways to build. That's a that's a small scale hybrid event, but I think we're going to see a lot more of those too. Okay. Next question has to do with um, one of our biggest challenges we've had, and that's, that's my personal uh, statement on that: is getting from our students uh, into membership, uh, full membership, and becoming young professionals. Uh, are there any new ideas, initiatives, et cetera, in the works for helping us uh, meet that challenge? Yeah. So um, this year I put into place a membership ad hoc and they're looking at one of, so there was a membership ad hoc in place um, last year. Um, I revised the charter and specifically put in this ad hoc charter for them to look at a graduated uh, YP, student to YP uh, membership model. And we anticipate, because what I heard when I was, when, every time I talked to YPs or students, what they tell me is, you know, and I ask students, well, are you going to become an, a full IEEE member? And they're like, well, I wonder if I can afford it. And I go, well, what do you want? And they go, well, I want to be able to pay in installments or I want to be able to pay in a graduated way. So, you know, that's what we hear from them. That's what I've heard from them. So what we're looking at is, you know, last year we came out with the half price student membership and we're going to continue that. It's been very successful, but that's for students. So what we're talking about is students to young professional or full membership. So what we're going to look at is another type of promotional code. Um, and, and it's something that it, we've already been running an experiment and it'll be in the, the experiment has shown 60% or higher retention rates, which are, is phenomenal. It's much higher than we've been getting. And so what we're going to, it's a, uh, uh, I don't know I don't want to be specific on what it'll look like, but it's a graduated type of increase. That we'll be offering keep your uh, fingers uh, crossed. It has to pass the board. Uh, but I, I believe the proposal is, is a, a, a big discount in your 1st year out of school and then you know, a little small discount right. the next year and, and, and leading your way up to it. So it, it um, uh, we find that if we, if we can keep folks for the 1st couple of years, uh, while they get a 1st home or get married or find a job, it, you know, it, we, uh, it's a legitimate complaint about the, the cliff that people face uh, for membership. If we can help help uh, bring people along. Um, we find that they they stay with us so uh, said, for the rest of their careers. So he says a discount. I say a graduated increase. It's tomato tomato, but it's the it's same, same thing. thing. <laughs> okay. Well, one other question has to do with the upcoming uh, regional realignment that is being discussed. Is there any updates on that? Uh, I think that I know that the committee has been working very hard, uh, not committee, MGA. Uh, it's been pushed to MGA. I, I know that they've been working very hard. There's been multiple proposals. Um, I um, am waiting to hear what comes out of MGA. That's what I'll say. I don't really want to say anything more. I know there's multiple proposals. Maybe, maybe Kathy, just to mention the, um, uh, for those who are not following this as closely, the conversation has been about uh, region eight and region ten, uh, 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 two very very large regions, um, and uh, uh, you know whether uh, they should be split into two, and whether we should, uh, if if we were to do that, whether we'd have to find uh, uh, perhaps uh, find uh, two regions that we might uh, combine to others to to make room for for those. It's, it's really a question about equity for folks in in very large regions. How do you manage uh, 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 a region that crosses uh, a dozen time zones? But um, it's all very much in discussion at this point, but that that's kind of where the conversation has been. Okay. Yeah, well, all over the place well, now that it's not, yeah, I mean, it's not even, that. they're not even, yeah, I mean, it's not even in region 10 anymore. It's, who knows? I mean, I hear something different every day, so I wouldn't get too worked up about it. If you want my honest opinion, I don't know. I don't think anything will pass MGA. My experience is the same. Uh, 
I'm still looking through in the of these. We have a lot of duplicated uh, questions in here. One question uh, covered the uh, reaching out to high school. Of course, you you had a, a lot about our, our new STEM um, uh, program and way of uh, getting people um, involved in that and getting information and networking with other uh, STEM outreach. Is there any other um, efforts right, being made right now to uh, get get high school students more involved? So, yeah, um, Steve, you want to talk about, I mean, we had to cancel the tri engineering summer camp this year, but we do have that. But I mean, we basically have a, a really focused for the 1st time ever. Uh, K through 12, uh, program that engages volunteers, teachers, students. Um, but if you want to talk Steve more about specifically high school, we have yeah, multiple I, programs. I, uh, I think that this is an area where I think IEEE really made an impact during uh, during COVID when students found themselves at home, when uh, lots of uh, parents uh, were trying to uh, augment their children's education, and when uh, 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 middle school and high school educators were trying to uh, find material that they could use to, to build uh, virtual curriculums for teaching uh, virtually. Um, and so the tryengineering.org site, uh, uh, which is where we house all of our K through 12 student facing material, um, we saw a, a tenfold increase in, in visits and uh, the seminars we held for high school teachers on, on virtual engineering uh, classrooms um, uh, swarmed to capacity. We, we, had to, we, held, we had to hold, I think, uh, four times as many sessions as we had originally planned. What, one thing I'm actually pretty excited about, which uh, I'm, I'm trying to get other people excited about, uh, is a program called REACH, which I think many people don't know about. Um, it's actually run out of our history center. Um, and uh, it's funded by the IEEE Foundation. It's, uh, when you look at, uh, at the number of high school educators who actually feel qualified to teach engineering, it's a small number. Uh, but engineering impacts all of our coursework. Um, uh, in uh, topics like history and in uh, 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 all the all the social studies on on uh, on language arts, um, and Reach has been looking to try and uh, infuse technology content into the other parts of the curriculum, and so that, for example, uh, uh, providing materials that a, uh, a social studies uh, educator could use to discuss the impact of technology uh, in America and uh, the impact on uh, events in history and the uh, changes in standards of living around the world impacted by technology. And um, it brings engineering content into the classroom uh, in a kind of a sneaky way um, in ways that the that uh, faculty are not particularly trained in science and engineering uh, feel comfortable talking about, but with grounds the technology in uh, the larger world in ways that compel students to find out more about it. And um, uh, uh, it's a small program today. Um, uh, for example, we have a, a module talking about the impact of refrigeration on the world. It seems like a crazy kind of topic, but um, air conditioning and refrigeration, of course, opened large parts of the United States uh, to uh, improve standards of living. It's changed the way that uh, we deliver food around the world. It's allowed uh, drug delivery and, and so on. Um, and uh, uh, it's a compelling story, the way it's woven into its impact on history, and it, it encourages people to think a little bit more about the technology that's behind it. So that there's 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 some very interesting things that are happening. All of these which start as kind of small programs, and we've been trying to listen to for for good ideas and bring them forward for young people. Yeah, we've been thinking about. Um, uh, I, I'm on a like a really small sort of working group every week where we just sort of brainstorm and we've been talking about like you know who invented that and and just you know little video segments short video segments you know sort of like uh ted talks and um and also to have um science you know and again to have scientists explain just small little concepts you know to kids um and have i triple e members do that as well um, but there's, it's just that, you know, it's just so wide open about what we can do on this. And when you think about the, the range of grades as well, 
so it's just a very exciting new area um, that we're really looking forward to populating. And Jill, I'm having uh, this reach. We're, we're having reach come to the May board telecon. So uh, I did. I wasn't aware of it, and I was invited to talk to the history, uh, some history, something I was doing, and I saw this reach presentation and was blown away. So um, we have very limited time, but they're coming to to the board telecon in May. Sorry, I interrupted. I believe we've covered most of the topics in here. Um, Jill, Kathy, Steve, uh, the, th the three of you would like to. I saw wrap one this question up. pop up about. I saw one question pop up about are we going to offer memberships to high school students, and so um, not at this time, and that's a very interesting question. Um, one thing that we are going to offer on this portal is allow kids to print out a little membership sort of self identify, you know, I'm an IEEE something, but that to, and they can uh, print out badges that they've, you know, completed little modules. Um, but the idea is to get them to, to self identify with IEEE earlier. Um, I am not against the idea of, of what a junior membership might look like. I think that's a great idea, but there are liability issues with kids um, and uh, legal issues with uh, children, uh, which is were some of the things that we had to sort of conquer with the STEM portal. Um, so uh, it's a great idea, but there are legal issues that are associated with that. Uh, and those legal issues are different in every country where IEEE has activities. And we've been building um, uh, in background all the framework we need to be able to legally comply. It's a, it's a kind of invisible, invisible scaffolding, but it's required to support these kind of programs. Exactly. Okay, I think that was all of our questions. Thank you very much again, Steve Welby and Kathy Land for um, joining us tonight and for taking the time to give us these talks. Um, very helpful, very educational for, I learn something new every time I hear these. Um, but I would like to give you an opportunity to say a final word each if you would like to. Um. I'll, Steve, you want to go? I'll go first. Um, I just really want to thank all the volunteers in Region 3. Um, you've always been extremely supportive to me. Um, you're my, my IEEE family. Um, I wish I were available to be more in Region 3, um, but I'll be around after this gig. So <laughs> I hope you'll welcome me to, as, and support me as a volunteer in the region. Um, so, uh, but I do appreciate the opportunity tonight and I do apologize for the, I don't know what happened. It's never happened before. <laughs> I had like a total internet meltdown, but I appreciate your patience. But I do thank you each and every one of you for all the volunteer work. Although I know many of you put in many hours for IEEE and I do want to thank you personally for everything that you do. I don't have anything to add other than to, to echo uh, Kathy's thanks uh, for everything that you're doing. And I, I really look forward to the time when we'll be able to meet in person again uh, uh, and visit you all at uh, the big, big R3 meeting. Thanks, Jill. Th yep, thanks again, both of you. And thank you to all the attendees tonight. Um, if you have any other questions for them, why don't you send them to me and I'll see if I can get some answers for you. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Take care. Be well. Stay safe.